Thank you. Um, yesterday, when we left the hospital, my mine immediately went to get home to my child. But I also felt I needed to come speak to my fifth graders and address them because they have prayed such fervent prayers of hope, beautiful prayers of hope um, for healing. And I knew this was a defining moment in their lives. And I didn't want it to shake their faith that their prayers weren't answered. And so I went in and talked to them, ended up going into the sixth grade class and talking to them. And some of your parents who have kids in multiple divisions of the school heard about that and then what it did for the fifth and sixth graders. So they asked me to come in. They said, would you be willing to come in and speak? to the seventh through 12th grade. So that's what I'm doing. It's not any formal thing. I don't have it all written down. I'm just sort of sharing my heart and what we've been through in the last 48 hours. Um, I brought Ken's shirts, his Patriot shirts, and I'm in Patriot gear. Um, I told my mom this morning, I was like, what do I wear? I'm, I'm head, leaving here, headed to the funeral home to make his plans, which he had written out. He gave me a gift two weeks ago and walked it all through with me. He talked, and I was like, I don't want to talk about all this. And he had written it out and emailed it to me, then called me. He said, did you get my email? And I was like, yes, but I'm upset with you. I don't want to talk through all this. But he knew. He knew what the Lord was preparing him for. But um, then I told Mom, I got out of the shower. I prayed in the shower. What should I wear? And then it hit me, Patriot gear. I should wear Patriot gear. And I... Went in his closet and found his shirts. If you know Ken, you know he was not an athlete. He did play in high school for Kerwin, but Kerwin doesn't exist anymore. But he was one of those ones that got put in the last 15 seconds if the team was up like by 30, 40 points. That's all he ever got to play. He sat at the bench. But um, he's always reminded our daughter, it doesn't matter if you sit at the bench. You're still part of the team. You're still part of the win. Rejoice with them. But Ken wasn't an athlete, and I want to tell you a story. Two years ago, we always travel for our, our um, anniversary. We always take a trip somewhere in December. We do something special for our anniversary. And two years ago was our 25th, and I had been wanting to go to Magnolia, to Waco. So we went to San Antonio. We flew into San Antonio and went to Waco, and then we said Dallas. People said Dallas is a neat place to visit, so we took the rental car and traveled up to Dallas. And I was trying to make our plans for Dallas and what we were going to do in Dallas. And somebody told me about AT&T Stadium. They were like, go see AT&T Stadium. And let me give you a word of advice. If you're ever in Dallas, pay the $35 and take the tour. It is phenomenal. And we're not sports fans. I think they were playing the Green Bay Packers. Are those New York people? Is that New York? No. Where's Green? That's Wisconsin. Wisconsin. They were playing the New York team that weekend. And we, they were playing the Giants. And we had like eight guys from New York in our group and Ken and I. And they were like pumped. Um, they were a, a black group of men who were on a boys' trip. They were like 40-year-old men, and we had the best time with them. It was fun to watch it through their eyes. They weren't Dallas fans, honest, honestly, but we had the best time with that group. They were in our tent group of 10. But anyways, when I was telling them about the AT&T tour, I was like, do you want to go to AT&T Stadium? They say it's a really neat tour. It's phenomenal to see. He was like, yeah, that sounds good. And he said, now, who plays there? That really was his, he didn't know. He didn't know sports. He didn't know pro sports. But he didn't know Patriot sports. He did. Seventh through ninth, or no, ninth is watching here. Seventh through eighth don't know that so much. But some of you know that. The ones who have graduated know that. He was one of your biggest cheerleaders. He got excited for you. And he rejoiced with you. He loved to watch you in fine arts too. And he always loved to watch in the Academy of Arts. Not everybody's, a, as, as he can attest to, not everybody's an athlete. And that's okay. God gives us different talents. But he was a Patriot fan. Some of you don't know this. I'm a Gospelite graduate. So I'm actually a lion, but I don't claim the lions anymore. I'm a Patriot. So, but my freshman year at Gospelite, in a chapel, a revival broke out. And it's like something I've never witnessed before, never seen. And I'm not here to work things up 
or to make you doubt your own spiritual walk. But I just want to share. We prayed for hope. We believed for hope. We believed for a miracle. And to some, it might seem that that miracle didn't come. And it's easy for the devil to put that in your minds. You prayed for it. I didn't. See, God didn't answer it. But what God did was a different miracle. The miracle was for Claire and I. I hadn't been able to see him in three weeks, and I just had every hope when I walked in there Monday. I hadn't talked to him in over a week and a half. And I had every hope when I walked in there Monday that my voice, my loud voice, because I kept talking to him loud. I'm like, well, I've got to make sure he hears me. My loud voice could, voice could bring him back. I took a blanket and spread over him. I put a pillow, a healing pillow case under there. Your poster was still in there. A week ago, they sent every personal thing home, even his glasses. And, but the one thing that remained was the poster y'all had signed. It, it, was, it was hanging there in his room. So that was there. I made my own poster with pictures and put it in there. And I was going to heal him. And so I said, well, he, well he, at least the heart rate monitor go. And they were like, Nothing will show if he can hear you, but we, we do believe that people in sedation can hear you. So um, I just went in there. I prayed over him. I had had people lined up to call in and pray over him. Claire got to talk to him, and then the doctors came in and really bombarded me with what the decision needed to be made. And so we gathered a group from the church leadership. We gathered my family, and we talked to the doctors. And one of the deacons spoke up. They wanted us to really follow through that afternoon. The doctor did in the room, but one of the deacons followed up and said, let's give it till the morning. Let her go home and talk to her daughter. So we did. So the plan was made to go back Tuesday at 10 a.m. And you were all here praying diligently for us, for God to give us the grace and the peace that we needed to walk him home. And I showed up and they were like, he's, he's made, it's not much. You know, don't, don't get your hopes up, but he's made for the first time in three weeks, he had made a little bit of an improvement. And they were like, we don't know. Maybe we need to, to hold back on this and let's give this a little more time. And so a lot of people, I didn't want to give a false sense of hope. They said he's still very sick. And so uh, I didn't want to give a false sense of hope. But what it gave to me was I knew he had heard us Monday. I knew he could hear it. I knew that's what he was doing. He was reaching within the deepest part of himself <laughs> to show a little bit of improvement so that he could give me that gift that he had heard me tell him about all the prayers that were going on here, all the prayers that are going on from all over the world, the movement of hope that he had started. So Tuesday was a beautiful day of getting to talk to him and other people got to come in and talk to him. People got to call in and pray with him. And so we came home Tuesday evening, and the doctor said, it's very grim. It's still very grim. And there was a quality of life issue. And fortunately, in his wisdom, he had talked me through that. We have our legal documents in place, but the legal documents don't really spell out some of those gray areas where, okay, they're talking about assisted living the rest of his life. He would never pastor. her. Claire's daddy really wouldn't be. Claire's daddy. We could go visit him, but so we had a lot of decisions and, but they were like, hey, your people are praying. They even said that. Y'all have got people praying and it's worked overnight. Let's see what it does again tonight. But I want to tell you how it worked overnight, Tuesday night. In my prayer time, Wednesday morning, I woke up very early. I had not slept very much. I woke up very early and I was wrestling with God on this. And I was like, I don't want to have doubt the faith to believe that you can heal him. I'm scared if I doubt that you won't do it. But in my heart of hearts, I feel the healing's not going to come here. But I feel like if I doubted to believe that God would not do it. And God told me, he was like, your prayers don't change my plans. Your prayers help me change your heart. And I knew then the heaven was going to hold the healing. His personal doctor called. She's not been allowed in the hospital. His personal doctor called. She had looked through all, the, all of his tests, and she said, 
And she's walked through him. Y'all know he's come through some deep trials. And I said that I'll roll up my sleeves and we'll do the hard work. This is going to be the hardest fight. But our song is dancing in the minefields. That's what the promise is for, to walk through those minefields and go sailing in the storms. And I, I, we could do it. It was going to be hard, but we could do it if God had the healing here. But you can give somebody life. You can sustain their life. You can make them live, but you can't make them be alive in here. You can keep them alive, but not help them live that life. So his doctor, his personal doctor called and talked to me through some things. He had had a chest x-ray yesterday morning, and she said his lung, he, he can't, I mean, he would have to have a lung transplant. His lungs are gone. So after that, Claire came in, and we talked. And I knew that the 24 hours of a miracle wasn't for Ken's healing. I knew it was to, to give time in my heart to come to peace. I wasn't ready Tuesday morning. I stayed up all night Monday begging God. I literally begged God for 24 more hours. Didn't think he could do it, but he did it. When I walked in Tuesday morning, he actually did it. But I just said, I need more time with him. I just need to know. So I, um, Claire crawled in, Ben, we were talking, and I told her what the doctor had said. And it had been a difficult two days for her. But she and I, we've had a lot of voices around us. We've had a lot of people around us. But I told her, I said, Claire, really, in this moment, it really comes down to you and me. Because you and I are going to be the two to, to walk out of here to live this life. Just the two of us. And so we talked through what she said, if they go in and he's made some improvement, can you give him 24 more hours? And I said, yes, I'll do that. I'll make you that promise. But she said, if he hasn't, let's let him go to heaven. God had brought her to that place. She was not there before, but God brought her to that place. So I made my way to the hospital yesterday. I didn't tell anybody, not even my closest friends. I only told my family what I was planning to do if the doctor said because two, Monday and Tuesday had been this big fanfare of everybody praying and everybody having hope, and it had been a lot of voices. We live a very public life. It had been a lot of voices, but I just needed to be Claire and I and God. I just needed it to be quiet so I could just hear from him. So we walked down the hall. We walked to the room, and the nurses met me. You have to gown up. It's, it's a whole process, and the nurses met me and said, the doctors need to talk to you. And I said, are they going to tell me it's time? And she said, yes. And I said, I'm at peace. Go call them. I tell them I'm here. I'm at peace. So we made the plans. And they explained to me how it would work. And I still doubted the heart. I was like, God, help me know I'm doing right. Help me. And I begged Kent. I literally stood at his bedside and begged him. I was like, please open your eyes. Please blink, flutter, give me a, a twitch, something. But he's been on a paralytic. He's not only been on sedation, he's had to be on a paralytic medicine, which means he cannot move at all. Nothing. But when you take the ventilator out, you have to take, you have to lift the paralytic. It's a, it's a law. You have to lift the paralytic off of a patient because they will gas, you know, not gas, they'll try to take breaths on their own because that's what your body's made to do. They say it'll go very short. It will not, he won't be here long. So they lifted the paralytic and I had really forgotten about that part. I went over there. They asked me to step out as they were cleaning him up and taking the machines off. And I said, no, I'm going to walk it to the end. I'm going to, you just going to do it in front of me. I'm going to stay here. So I took his hand and I was looking at him and I started singing hymns. And I'm a contemporary girl, but I couldn't think of any contemporary songs at the moment, so I sang hymns to him. And they kept watching and looking, and they would check his heartbeat, and it was still. And she said to me, she said, it's getting close. And so I was still holding his hand, and when she said to me it was getting close, I said, Ken, are you seeing it yet? Can you see heaven? And he squeezed my hand tightly. Ken's given me a lot of things in this life. He's spoiled me in many ways. But that was the greatest gift he's ever given me. I knew that my husband could see it. And that was the hope. That was the hope God had given him a few weeks early. That was the hope he was seeing. 
He was seeing all he's faithfully preached about. He was seeing it in sight. It was in sight and he was getting, he was here but going there. And so I started singing Amazing Grace. And as I sang, well, we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun. We've no less days to sing God's grace than when we've just begun. And I saw her, Patsy Michelak was in, they allowed Patsy Michelak to be there with me, and she was holding me behind me. And they saw, because I was like, did I imagine that? I thought somebody at first had touched my hand, because I didn't think he could do it. But then they were like, no, that was him. So Patsy Michelak was holding me, and I saw the nurse look at her, and I saw her take his, look, listen to his heart, and so I knew. I looked up, I said, he's gone, and, and she said, yes. And so he saw his faith was made sight. All that suffering, all that that turmoil was left behind, and he was healed. Not the healing we prayed for here, not the miracle we prayed for here, but God did give the miracle. And I know you're at an age where this can make you bitter or better. It's a defining moment. And you can question, did God hear us? Did God answer? But I don't want you to doubt it. God did answer. He just answered in a very different way. And I don't know what God's doing. And I don't want to work emotion up. But you're his legacy. You're his legacy sitting here. You're the ones that are going to go out and change the world. And that doesn't have to look like a missionary. It doesn't have to look like a pastor. It doesn't have to look like a full-time Christian service. You can choose whatever God has for you. But carry that hope out of here. Don't let that hope die. And know beyond a shadow of a doubt because none of us are really promised tomorrow. Know that you have that ultimate hope, that heaven is your home, that you have trusted Christ as your personal Savior. I've been where you're at. It's easy to sit and pretend and play because you get preaching it. Church, you get it at home, you get it in here, and you just sit. I remember sitting and watching, thinking, who's going to walk in today to speak to us? I mean, I was a Christian school t kid too. God didn't get a hold of my heart till college. But don't let this be in vain. Grasp that hope. Take it out of here. Let it make a difference. He is your biggest cheerleader, and He's still cheering you on. I think the best days of Union Grove are ahead. I really do. And that's hard for me to say, selfishly sometimes. Because I don't want his legacy to live. But he had the vision, and somebody will come along and carry it out. And you'll help be part of that. But I want you to know you're loved. That I appreciate all the prayers that you've offered on our behalf. And I want to assure you it was not in vain. God did do a miracle. He did a miracle in our family's hearts. And keep that hope alive. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this time that we've had, just to be honest and open and real. So often we pretend that we're strong and everything's okay. And it's not. We say God is good. And in the moments like this right here, we have to live our faith out and say, God, this is not good, but I trust you to make it good. Help these young men and young women to first of all know that they have that eternal hope and help them to grasp that hope that Ken has, this movement Ken has started of hope. Help them to grasp that hope and take it out. Whatever you've called them to do in the future, help them to hang on to this moment and to be able to look out, look back in this time and see that our prayers were answered, but in a different way. Help when they face their own trials. Right now, everything's rosy. Life is not hard too much in high school, but they're going to face times like this too. Help them to realize that you are real and that you can give us the miracles you have for us, and sometimes they don't look the way the world thinks they should look. Don't let Satan for a minute entered their thoughts that, see, I won. Your prayers weren't answered. Help God to give them the peace to know their prayers have been answered. Thank you, God, for these kids who have been part of Kent's life, 
for the joy he's had to watch them play. For even the video yesterday that was found of him sitting and rejoicing over that state tournament. Thank you for letting him get a ticket in, for getting to see that. Help these kids to go on and take that hope with them. We love you, Lord. We trust you, Lord, even when it's hard to understand. Help the best days of Union Grove to be ahead. We know you've got a purpose and a plan for everything. And we are just watching and waiting to see where we all go on this journey. Be with us today, dear Lord. Give us the strength for the next few days. And we're going to thank you and give you all the praise and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. In Ken's words, if you've ever been in this congregation, you are loved. And know that you are loved.